Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. This is your host, Deacon Jonathan Stewart, and today I'm talking to Thomas Nivagoen. I didn't ask how to say his last name from Century Guild Publications. Thomas, how are you and how do we say your name? Nigovin. Nigovin. I I was saying I'm told is an incorrect pronunciation. Oh, well you must know how to say your own name. I, I had a teacher in high school. They used to call me Negovin. And he would, uh, I said, no, it's Nagovin. He's like, no, it's not. <laughs> so I guess the proper pronunciation is Negovin, but as an American, uh, you know, two generations in, we say Nagovin. But yes. Nagovin. Yes. <laughs> so uh, Thomas is uh, behind uh, Century Guild Publications and the Century uh, Guild uh, uh, Gallery. And uh, I was saying to him before we started recording, uh, you know, his team reached out to us, which is really exciting because he his his project really covers an era of art that is particularly close to my heart that I particularly love. Uh, I now have two of his books. I, I am a poor uh, copywriter, but I'm going to buy them all, as should you, because they all look amazing. <laughs> Hey, talking about being poor, that reminds me. <laughs> we actually need your financial help to do the show. So we literally can't do it because we do have some costs um, uh, to pay, but but also j- just for the time and the effort and what have you. So you can help us out financially by going to patreon.com slash Gnostic. You can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can put a cap on that too. We usually do anywhere from four to seven pieces of media that we charge. Right now, it's, it's, we max out at six, to be honest, but you can cap that. Here's the thing, though, is we actually put out a lot lot more media than that per month we put out anywhere from five to twelve uh depending on what's going on so uh you help do that and if people if more people don't sign up or if people stop signing up then we won't be able to do any of that so there's there's enough of the commercial uh you can also do paypal.com slash gnostic for one-time donations uh we understand if you can't help us out financially but you can help us out in other ways like and subscribe rate us leave us good reviews on the podcatcher of your choice on youtube share it on social media most importantly the you know ear to mouth is still powerful in this day and age so uh take a favorite episode it'll probably be this one send it to a friend who you think would appreciate it okay thomas we we got through the commercials um although talking about commercials uh we'll do a plug at the end but i'll throw that up centuryguild.net so so today you, we're, we're talking about infernal creatures which i have a copy of here as well as some of your other um uh, uh, diabolical publications because it is October and we're doing a month of uh, uh, Halloween themed content. Now, sometimes on the show, we you know we, we try to stick pretty close to Gnosticism, but we expand it out to talk about related issues and occultism and spirituality in general. The, you know, the, for this particular book, although I have a suspicion we're going to be talking again in the future about a book that ties in a little bit more with what we do on the show, maybe the connection's a little looser, but hey, we're going to find some interesting connections to the history of modern Gnosticism, and it's spooky month. We need that spooky content. Uh, Thomas, I'm finally going to let you speak. Can you tell us about Century Guild and why you started it? Um, I te- you know I started it because I'm unemployable. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> the I, you know I just a love for uh, the the thing that originated was it was a passion for Art Nouveau, uh, the art movement in the late 19th century where where artists were using nature and spirituality as a convergence uh uh and and using it in the aesthetics from everything from furniture to poster design to jewelry to to ceramics and glass making and everything and so I, i really fell in love with that era and then started the company based around that the the kind of paris italy uh germany 19th late 19th century but then because of my own personal interests it it did expand a lot more into symbolism a lot more into uh elements of mysticism and and the way that those uh ideologies played out um in the art that people lived with. It's one thing for people to do things as a course of study. It's another for people to do things in a, you know, in a, in a religious uh, or meditative setting. But one of the things that was really interesting about 
uh, especially the late 19th century, is that you had it really creeping into people's lives in a very direct way, which kind of leads into infernal creatures. I tried to, to bring it to that. Um, and the idea was you had people using microscopes and telescopes, and so they understood that there was legitimately more to the world than met the eye. And then people started applying that to their internal landscapes. And so that's why you had uh, the resurgence in mysticism and art. You had the Salon Rosacroix in Paris. You had the Theosophical Society, of course. Um, and so the elements of things that we would consider a cult or mystical in nature were, were very much a part of advertising uh, and also just decoration uh, in terms of decorating buildings or, uh, you know, tapestries that people would have in their house or things like that. Uh, and so then kind of as it goes then to Infernal Creatures is that's a collection of artworks uh, really hovering pretty heavily around the early 20th century, late 19th century that use devils and witches um, either in political cartoons or uh, advertising or theatrical productions or things like that. I'm just going to keep talking until you, <laughs> until you ask me something. <laughs> but that's the overview. That's how I got into it was just that I uh, had worked in antique stores and always loved Art Nouveau um, and really just wanted to immerse myself in it. And then over the last 20 years, Century Guild is is going to be 23 years old coming up, um, is that I found that the things that related to mysticism or Gnosticism or occult thinking or any of that were really the, the tiniest margin of what other people were specializing in. And so if you're an art collector that's interested in uh, artworks of any kind from 1880 through 1920 that had that leaning to it, uh, I was kind of your go-to person. And what we've done now in the last few years is taken all of the things from our photographic archives and started publishing books. Uh, it's, it's a nice thing to sell an artwork or an object. It's even more nice to be able to tell the story to a much larger group of people than the person who's purchasing it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And to, to we talk a lot on this show about the links between Gnosticism, mysticism, spirituality, occultism, and art. But to, to for the people who may not have... Uh, you know, a background specifically in this era, in these movements, the, the connection is is quite powerful and strong. It's a very literal connection between, say, the symbolists, uh, the artists uh, between the, behind the Salon Rose Croix, uh, uh, many of the Art Nouveau artists were, were literally part of the Gnostic and occult movements of the time. And if they weren't yeah. literally part of them, they knew the people in those movements yeah. and they were inspired and inspiring them. So this is very, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, directly connect it to, to what we talk about in the show. Instead of a more philosophical, hey, have you ever noticed that art and spirituality, what we call imagination, seems to be tied to whatever it is that we call religion and spirituality? You know uh the imaginal in our in our perspective can, can so you, you did sort of uh touch upon it but could you tell us more about infernal creatures and, and why specifically this book and this theme as you go through <clears throat> your extensive collection one one thing i'll comment on with what you just said is that that's something that i think um gives it a good context it, it, the thing that you just said is that that conversations if you were in a metropolis like if you were in Paris or New York, conversations about the convergence of religion and spirituality and, and anything metaphysical were as inescapable as talking about masks or Dave Chappelle mm -hmm. in October of 2021. Um, as, and I would say that we, we today have conversations like this and they are in a, in a very narrow place, but that is not uh, 
my understanding of what was happening in artistic circles in the late 19th century. Uh, as you said, people were directly involved, like they were a Mason, they were a Gnostic, they were, um, you know, in, in invested in their Christianity, whatever it was. And if you weren't, you had those conversations with people. And I remember being surprised when even artists like Matisse, who you don't think of uh, as, as being mystical in that way. Well, they were, you know, Matisse was a student. I, I'm almost sure this is right of, um, oh my God, who's the guy that does the super heavy ornate? Gustave Moreau. And the idea was that even when you look at things that don't seem like they have those mystical elements, they were looking at the heavily Baroque artworks of the 19th century. And they were thinking, well, okay, like they're looking at the ocean. And it's, you know, they were taught to paint every, you know, element of the wave. And they're thinking, but what does the water feel like? You know, how do you get that sensation and so they would just put the blue cobalt on the canvas um and so the thing that i just just found is that the the, the spiritual elements um of why people were making art creeps heavily into into artists and, and work that uh the majority of people would never expect that that was where they were coming from um and so that comes back to the thing about just again, it was it was it, in my understanding, it seemed to be inescapable in in artistic circles and in society circles to be discussing uh, those metaphysical elements. And so then, your question was then, how does that relate to infernal creatures? I'm, yeah, I'm, it, it, and also just you know, why did you you have an extensive collection? Uh, why why this book? Why this topic? Why these art pieces? What what really got into your head about putting out this particular publication? Uh, over the years, I bought a lot of work with devils and witches in it. Is how, <laughs> is how it started. <laughs> I, um, if you like. If you're interested in a book on 19th century bicycles, I would not be the person to do it. It's just not something that I collected. Uh, anything that had witches or devils, I would sell really well, really quickly. Uh, and that was kind of the market that I was developing because it was my own personal interest aesthetically. Uh, so I hate for the answer to be so pragmatic, but it was, uh, uh, you know, something like, the Alphonse Mucha book, which we can talk about in another show, you know, that was a different, you know, that was a, you know, much more of a calling. Whereas the, uh, the, the other books that we've done are just, just kind of, I think, <clears throat> I think the way to explain it is that I've spent decades building this collection, building this archive. And I, in, in owning an art gallery, I, it reached a point where I, I felt like I owned a nightclub. Uh, we would have openings, there'd be lines around the block. Um, it would be packed. And there'd be so many people you couldn't look at the art. And the experiences that for me that were the most rewarding were when I would get to talk to someone about the Theatre de Grand Guignol or, or if someone was asking about um, the Salon was or I'm talking about uh, Carlo Schwab or, or some of these artists, like those, those conversations were always what was so rewarding to me. And, and so many of the things that I know are things that I had read in a magazine from 1912 or from 1897 and things that aren't in books. And so the, with, with Infernal Creatures specifically, it was just, I knew these little tidbits about whether it was the artist or the product and just things that, that make it more uh, of an enriching experience, in my opinion, to look at. And so with the poster books that we've done, it's it's mostly me just trying to, to share images that aren't on the internet anywhere uh, and to share bits of historical information. Um, and then as it relates to the things that are a little more spooky, um, it's hard to not love things that, that combine 
uh, the whimsy with the naughtiness, you know, like when you had the cover of that book and it's, that's for a silent film called The Devil and Circe. Uh, you know, and just the idea that, you know, in 1921, I think 20 was the, was the year for that movie. It's a lost film. Um, you know, but the art is so fun and so, uh, you know, to me, it's, uh, it's enchanting to be looking at all the ways that you can use archetypes against type a little bit. Uh, the fact that they can use the devil in such whimsical ways to me has always been really interesting. Um, and uh, I mean, that definitely applies across the board, but you know, the devil has just always been in advertising and theater productions, uh, a fun archetype to play with because there's so much preconception in it. I told you, man, I will just talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that, that actually segues me quite, quite well into, into my next question, which was, you know, you talked about it at this time period, people were really having the unavoidable, uh, it was the, the discussions around, uh, around religion, spirituality, alternative religion, occultism, magic, mysticism. This was uh, what was going on in the intellectual life. But particularly in Belle Epoque, France, uh, they seem to be really into the devil, more and more perhaps than, than some other uh, time periods, areas, what have you. What, what is it about the devil in Belle Epoque, France? I, I think that they had like when we talk about those conversations being inescapable, I think you had people considering realms other than the visible uh, in a way that they hadn't before because people people's bellies were full. You know, uh, you had the Industrial Revolution, you had a middle class for the first time. So it wasn't like people were having high thoughts and then other people were laboring like to their, you know, bloody hands um so i think that there was there was a lot of middle ground where people could kind of lean back and speculate a little more and then you know something that i i don't know if this is directly accurate um but there was there was a huge huge especially when you're talking about paris uh, there was a huge fervor over the idea that uh, that the Freemasons were Satan worshipers. Mm -hmm. And so kind of in the way that you had the Satanic panic here in the 70s and 80s in America, um, which of course then spawned a lot of art, I think that there, there's an element where, especially by the 1890s um it was very it was it was more prevalent on people's minds probably than before but the teeth had been taken out of it i think uh, a couple decades earlier people might have been a little more nervous about it but yeah by the 1890s it was like everybody had been talking about satanism um and so i think that that's why also too we got to remember advertising was new um we take for granted the idea of large color posters we take it for advantage you know billboards we take that for granted um but it wasn't until the 1880s that large color posters were able to be printed the lithographic process was was only functioning on a very small level or, or small scale uh and so the idea of large color posters really didn't catch on till the 1890s and so then when you're advertising, you need images that conjure ideas. And so if it's the idea of something mischievous, you know, you're going to show the devil, you know, if it's, uh, um, if you're trying to show, I don't know, not that you would be, if you're trying to, to sell hot sauce, uh, you're going to have the devil pouring something on a, you know, on someone's, someone's uh, sandwich. Um, 
yeah, again, I could keep going. Do you want me? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm the thinking about Leo Taxil, you know, I'm thinking about all of the, uh, you know, I was, you know, I don't know if you were going to come in on that, but you know, the, the thing is that as you and I both know, um, there's a reason why there was a satanic panic and it was, it was Leo Taxil, which you probably know as much or more about than I do. Yeah. Well, um, uh, most modern Gnostic churches, uh, including the movement that, that I'm part of, have uh, lineages that go back to Jules Duinel. And we've actually, I've been meaning since we started the show to actually do a show on, on the Taxil hoax. But can you can you talk a bit of, you know, Duinel, we don't have to talk too much about Duinel, but he fell for this hoax. So can you tell us about the hoax and uh, how it inspired some of the art that's in the book, including a, a beautiful looking fine art poster to sell for your site? The... Um... It's funny that that uh, that Freemasonry poster is in um, it's in my uh, my eight year old son's library. <laughs> of, of got, he has his own little library in the house here, um, and uh, it's one of my favorite pieces. And it is one that's in the book. And it's the it's the famous poster of Baphomet, and it's the mysteries of the Freemasons. And so Leo Taxil, um, I know he'd had some financial scandal uh there was a scandal where he convinced the naval military that there was a sea serpent and got them to <laughs> launch ships to go try and 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 bomb this sea serpent uh and and so then the books that he wrote were were charming titles like the mistresses of the pope the debaucheries of the confessor um all of these heavily anti-clerical texts. And when he had pushed that as far as he possibly could, he announced that he had an epiphany uh, and wanted to rectify the harm that he had done to the Catholic Church. And so he began publishing works that included this anti-Freemasonry book. And, and he came up with a fake quote that was like, uh, if I remember the quote correctly, is it Lucifer is God yeah. that he misattributed um, to the leader of the Freemasons in, in Paris. And, but he uh, basically spent years developing this idea that the Masons descending from the Templars, worshiping Baphomet, all of these things that were the satanic panic. And he he said that he would push it so far that he couldn't believe people were taking him seriously. <laughs> like he was, there was a speaking event that he did where he walked in and told people that he just had a vision. And, and forgive me, I can't remember who he said he saw, but he made the name up <laughs> like... Bugs Bunny. I mean, he made some name up and he said, no one even asked me, who is that, that you said that you saw? They just started repeating. He had a vision. He saw this. And he, uh, this is all later that he, that he said these things. He said, I couldn't believe that the further I pushed it, the further the, the hook sunk. Um, and so he was pushing uh, to get an audience with the Pope. And eventually, this person who had written the most salacious, sleazy novels about, you know, priests having torture chambers and, and all of these, you know, highly sexualized S&M books, uh, got an audience with the Pope. And then he felt like, really, there's no further that I could take this. And he held a press conference to announce that he was just kidding. <laughs> And the police had to escort him out of Paris because people were so furious. And uh, yes, many people fell for this hoax. Um, it is, uh, if you look up pranksters, you will see there'll be a line item that says the Taxil hoax. Like it was, he literally took uh, the entirety of France for a ride Um and in the book is this poster for uh, 
this large hardcover volume that he he published that was going to blow the lid off of the secrets of, of Freemasonry. And it was just all made up and just, again, each thing more absurd than the next. And people still quote them today. Um, that's something that if you go to any website and it's like FAQs and stuff like that, it's like, well, I heard that, and it'll be something from this book that was all completely fabricated. Yeah. Uh, and you would know better than I about how that relates to uh, the Gnostic movement, but, but yeah, certainly not the only person who was, was taken. No, uh, the, the very quick version is, um, the, uh, uh, one of the main Gnostic leaders, uh, the person, even though there have been Gnostic churches before him, but Jules Duanel had a vision restoring the Gnostic church in the 1890s. He fell for the taxial host, uh, uh, hoax, sorry, and renounced Gnosticism and Freemasonry and sort of followed taxial around and, you know, wrote all these books and what have you. And then when the hoax was revealed, uh, came back to Gnosticism. So, uh, that, that's the fast version. Someday we'll do a show on it uh the founder <laughs> the founder of the show that the founder of the network uh, uh father tony sylvia he's always had a, a long time fascination with the taxial hoax it actually has a received a first or second edition of taxial's book i believe as as a gift for his his priest anniversary so uh we'll have to throw a picture of that up uh the somewheres on our on our uh social media but but moving on uh thomas um Sexy ladies, they still sell products, right? But what's special about the sensuous women and the witches that, that, that's in the art in this book that sort of sets us apart from other sexy ladies selling us stuff? Um, I would, there's, 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 there's probably two, there's two parts to that. One is that there's a lot of art that's in there that's, that's kind of, um, I, I, I guess I guess the simplest answer is that we have to remember that in the late 19th century, advertising is new. And you also had that idea of the femme fatale, uh, which was, was also a new idea. Um, and when you look at how, you know, the reason I'm kind of hesitating on this is that there's there's not a lot of, of femme fatale. Like a lot of the women in the book are kind of virginal in comparison to the Luciferian. You know, you've got a, a woman uh, and the devil's offering her chocolate, you know, and she's clearly very pious, but he's tempting her with with this chocolate. Um, so there's there's that element that that's kind of why I was was pausing is that there is the element where there's the that it's a foil against uh, the tempter. And then there's the other part, like the, the image on the cover, where, where she's a willing participant. And the idea that that keys into, into advertising is it's like a dare. Um, it's daring women to be naughty. And think about society. You know, women didn't have the right to vote. Think about what gender roles were at that time. So the idea, like, it's something that you'll always see women uh, doing things that they shouldn't be doing. They'll always be redheads <laughs> in early advertising art. So, like, if a woman is smoking a cigarette, which was a man's domain, um, it's always a redhead, uh, you know, 90% of the time. Um, and so... If then they have a woman taking a piece of chocolate or something, the redhead then was a code for a woman who goes against the grain, which is, you know, that's an old advertising trope. Like, don't be like everyone else. Be, you know, be on the cutting edge. Um, so to answer your question, I, I think that the, the thing that's that's different is it's not different, is that it's, it's literally the same... Uh, it's the same mechanisms uh, that we have as, as, as far as triggers go. Um, and uh, it might be just a little more primitive in these uh, in a way that makes it, um, I don't want to say wholesome. Um, you know, I mean, if it's it's you know there there is an enchanting element to the late nineteenth century aesthetic, uh, 
and uh, I again I could I'm rambling. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is this this is this is the ramble show. This is the ramble the show. Thing is what so. I, you know, yeah. each one of these, it's like there's there's you know, um, you're asking questions that there's not an answer to. Yeah, you know, like what year was yeah. this person born? Like a lot of us, and then when you're looking at a book like this. In my head, I'm picturing 30 different artworks and thinking, well, each of these has kind of a different. Um, but so that's the general view. If there's a specific artwork, I could probably give you a, uh, you know, a detailed answer. Otherwise, I can talk about animal husbandry in the Parisian countrysides in the 1880s. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, can you, and, and please excuse my pronunciation, I actually do live in Montreal, the second largest French-speaking uh, uh, city in the world, uh, but I don't speak French, but can you tell us what was the Grand Guignol? Did I do it right? The Grand... Closer than an American. Uh, Grand Guignol? <laughs> yeah. It's, Grand Guignol means, uh, it, it, it's uh, the theater of the, of the big puppet. The Grand Guignol was, um, it was the, the first uh, modern experience that we would think of as like modern theater. It's like Blue Man Group with goat's blood. It was, <laughs> you had uh, people in the theater and the, it was a small church converted to a theater. Um, and it, it was horror. It was horror plays mixed with comedy. Uh, they called it hot and cold showers. They would get you laughing and then show you something really grotesque. And then when you were just completely freaked out, then they would throw a gag in. So it was, it was a very, uh, uh, it's a unique style that people will talk about things being a Grand Guignol style today. Uh, they'll still use it. Um, but so, for example, if they were slashing a woman's throat on stage, some guy would be chomping on a cigar with an apron and a bucket filled with goat's blood and entrails that when they cut the throat, they'd throw it into the audience and, you know, people would be vomiting. And, and part of their uh, scandal selling is the idea that you would take dates there knowing like that people were going to be vomiting and freaking out and... Uh, the special effects were incredibly advanced. They would do things like, uh, you know, there was one where a woman took another woman's face and shoved it onto a hot stove. Uh, and then when they lift it up, of course, the face is all burned. And so the theater tricks of making eyeballs pop out or making a burn appear or things, whether they did it with lighting or early prosthetics or things like that, um, it's something that if you hear anybody from Alice Cooper to Guillermo del Toro talking about their influences, like Tim Burton's a huge Grand Guignol fan. Um, it's kind of inescapable that if you're looking at modern horror, of course, like in a literature sense, you go back to something like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. But when it comes to performance, the Grand Guignol is really like the first uh, star in that constellation. Yeah. And did you have collections of uh, some of their, their show posters in the book? Yeah. The, the, in, in, in the Infernal Creatures book, uh, there are some, some posters from the Grand Guignol. That is uh, a personal area of collecting for me. Mm -hmm. Um, the Salon Rosacroix and the, uh, Grand Guignol are the two, the two things I kind of allow myself as a collector. And so, I, yeah, I have a huge collection of Grand Guignol ephemera. And um, of course, the most striking <clears throat> of them are the posters because they were glued up on the streets and meant to be titillating and terrifying. And so some are very risque and some are very gory. Um, and uh, I think in the book, there's one, uh, the sorcerer, or sorceress, I guess is what it would translate to, with a woman tied to a stake. And uh, it's very Halloween. <laughs> there, It's a very Halloween theater. And uh, much like with the Baphomet poster, we've reproduced some of them and have them on our website. Um, the originals are obviously very, very expensive. But so we've reproduced some of them. Um, and my thought is always that 
yes, that people should have these up for Halloween and maybe leave them up for Christmas. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you did mention Halloween, and uh, this is part of our, our month of Halloween programming. Good. Could you tell us what else that uh, Century Guild has uh, out or is is going to be coming out with that is also sort of macabre that other you know, fans of, of this genre uh, of these themes uh, should look for? I think that the, the, the most important thing um, is a series of books. We have the seventh volume of what's going to be an eight volume set is on Kickstarter right now. And it's a collection of artworks from a magazine called The Orchid Garden. And The Orchid Garden preceded Weird Tales, which is the quintessential American horror pulp. And The Orchidine Garden, uh, The Orchid Garden, is, it's very, it leans infinitely more into the Lovecraft territory the writers who were writing for the Orchid Garden were extremely European in their sensibilities. And so when you think about the first um, silent films, like the first horror film uh, was The Student of Prague. Um, and the man who wrote that was a writer for the Orchid Garden. The writer who invented the term robots was a writer for the Orchid Garden. So it's a convergence of science fiction and fantasy and horror, um, but it's a very gothic horror. It's not horror in that Grand Guignol way. It's very existential. Uh, one of the stories is, um, and it's, I think this, this is an Eastern European author that wrote this. It's a bunch of men sitting around a table and they're all talking about what would be the best way to die. And they're trying to outdo each other with the drama of their death. And during this dinner, one of them falls over dead and face plants on the table. And so the story ends with the men all nodding in agreement that he had the best death of all. Uh, and just because he just died, like there's no, um, it's very dark humor. Uh, and so a lot of the stories have been celebrated and reprinted <clears throat> over the years. But the thing that you never see are the artworks that accompany these. And there are very, very funny, silly artworks, things that are very sketchy and, you know, kind of German Weimar era uh, aesthetic. And then there's a lot that are really... Um, beautifully rendered, very dark, very um, German expressionist in nature. And so that entire series uh, documents, the, the magazine ran for three years and it, it, it reprints every artwork with synopses of the stories that are in the books by uh, biographical information on the artists. Uh, and so that is something that if you're interested in, in things that are a little bit strange, um, it's academically one of the most important things that we've done is documenting all of that. Well, uh, Thomas, it's been really amazing having you on, but uh, we should start to wrap up. Uh, as you hinted at before, this this won't be your uh, your last appearance. We're going to be very excited to have you back on to talk MUCA in a couple of weeks. And, and I'm sure that won't be the end of it either, because uh, what you're doing fits in quite well with uh, with our interests. And, you know, we'll have to talk about the Salon Rose Croix sometime. Uh, we, we do have a Paladin show uh, uh, that, that we that'll be coming out eventually. So uh, yeah, it, it's been really awesome uh, having you on. Again, I've been flashing up uh, uh, your website, but people also listening to this as as a podcast. So if you could just tell people where to find you online. Uh, CenturyGuild.net. Uh, if you go to CenturyGuild.net, we have, uh, there are a handful of original artworks, but, but the areas that I'm most proud of are if you go to our book section and our print section, we've reprinted a lot of uh, really rare, strange things. And then as it comes to the books, um, yeah, you know, there's a, there's a lot there and it's uh, artworks that you're not gonna see on the internet and, and hopefully a lot of interesting stories. 
Very beautiful. Well, before we uh, sign off, I'll just do a few quick uh, plugs. Uh, MyLandMeditation.substack.com. This is my weekly meditation, live online meditation for everybody. It's uh, 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. That's New York time, Montreal time. And my, I, I work part time as a, as a freelance writer, and I also work part time as as a mindfulness coach, working within the sort of secular psychological approach to meditation and mindfulness. So that's what this. this this morning of meditation is it's not particularly spiritual it's not particularly gnostic it's for everybody no matter what your background is it's free it's just a chance for me to get more experience teaching meditation to give back a little bit since i normally charge for it and we got a great crew of people who come out so uh everybody feel free to do that that's mileendmeditation.substack.com uh my parish is holygrail.substack.com if you're in the montreal area check us out you know with COVID still kind of going on uh we are doing some events online, so that means that you can uh, join us uh, uh, remotely for those occasional online events. Finally, uh, for uh, Talk Gnosis and the Gnostic Wisdom Network, we're doing more stuff on Twitch, uh, twitch.tv slash Gnostic Wisdom. So uh, we're doing, we're trying to do twice a month uh, live streams of, of the cult RPG. Uh, our founder, Father Tony, has been doing some, some video game streaming there. And then Tuesday evenings, the last Tuesday of the month, we're doing a live stream, which we do later archive, that is uh, a, a disparate panel of of interesting people, scholars, and Gnostics talking about one topic in a very uh, let it all hang out sort of way. So check all that out. Uh, Thomas, thanks again so much, and thanks again for the amazing work that you're doing. Bye. John, thank you so much.